Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're going back to a Genesis Apologetics classic that I somehow have never covered before. Either that, or I forgot that I already covered it, and it was so long ago that it was before I had my files properly organized to make these kinds of things easy to check, in which case I probably have some better stuff to say about it than I did way back then. In this one, they claim to debunk Lucy the Australopithecus in 11 minutes, which is weirdly specific. Are they only worried about debunking the Lucy specimen and not the hundreds of other specimens that we found? I mean, that's usually how it goes, Lucy's the famous one, so they nitpick some non-issues with that specimen and then try to extrapolate that to the species as a whole, all while ignoring all the other specimens that we have found that confirm the findings that they don't like about the Lucy specimen. So let's see how it goes. But first, a word from our sponsor. Okay, sitting in my favorite coffee shop, ready to start writing my book. Let's go. Here's your tea, and here's your ball gag banana and a pack of matches. Wait, all I ordered was the tea. What's with all that other stuff? Well, you don't use Surfshark when you're connected to my router here at the coffee shop, so I'm able to see a log of all the websites that you visit while you're connected to my public Wi-Fi network. I've seen things that cannot be unseen. What's Surfshark? Surfshark is a VPN, or virtual private network. It keeps your data private by encrypting all the information sent between your device and the internet, meaning that if you had thought to use it, then I wouldn't be able to access even your most basic data, like which websites you keep visiting, keeping it private and secure. It's always a good idea to use a VPN for some extra security, especially on public networks. Is that all it does? I mostly browse at home, so I generally don't have to worry about snooby coffee shop owners like you. It can also be used to unblock geo-restricted content, allowing you to watch Netflix or other streaming services using a different country's library. And in addition to all that, their clean web feature blocks ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, letting you browse the web safely and securely. That's a lot of features. Surely that must cost a fortune. Not at all. Vice Rhino viewers can pick it up with a special offer today by visiting my URL in the video description and using promo code RHINO at checkout, which will get them 83% off the regular price and three extra months for free. And this is all risk-free. It's backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't like it, you can get a full no-hassle refund. Okay, just one last question. You knew enough to bring out the ball gag, banana, and matches, so why didn't you also bring out the big- Sir, please, there are other customers here. I wouldn't bring that out in front of polite company. Surfshark, because we really don't want to know what you did with that banana. So what were the matches even for? Okay, so hear me out. First thing you do is you take the banana, put it in your mouth, then you keep it in there with the ball gag. Then you take the matches, you light one, and then you stick that... How do you go from hundreds of bone fragments to 47 skeleton bones to a missing link that supposedly lived 3 million years ago named Lucy? With years of careful excavation, research, corroborating finds, more research, and the occasional scientifically guided artistic rendering that does take a handful of artistic liberties. Lucy fills the pages of our public school textbooks, standing out as the leading icon for human evolution. Well, I don't know about leading icon, but she definitely was an important find. But, is Lucy really a missing link to humans, or is she just an extinct three and a half foot ape? She is both. And for future reference, this will be the last time that I correct their distinction of human as being separate from the apes. Humans are apes. Lucy was an ape. Chimpanzees are apes. We're all one big happy shit-flinging family, and don't try to tell me that humans don't fling shit. I have children. I know better than that. Speaking of, I'm almost out of disinfectant spray. Anyway, from here on out, just mentally replace ape in their video with non-human ape. And I will probably slip into similar terminology just to keep things consistent. Stick around to find out. In 1974, Donald Johansson found a small elbow bone in the Ethiopian desert. Looking around, he found several other bones that looked like they could be from the same creature. He later returned to uncover hundreds of bone fragments scattered along a hillside. The way they're phrasing this seems to be designed to cast shade on the idea that they are from the same creature. This is odd, given that creationists, including the Genesis Apologetics people, will usually agree that Australopithecus afarensis was a real species that existed, but they will insist that it was merely an ape, not a human or a half-human half-ape. 
Given that they don't deny the existence of the species, I'm baffled by their decision to portray its initial discovery in a light that seems to imply that the species itself doesn't exist, but was built out of bones from other species. Later, his team pieced together the hundreds of fragments into 47 skeletal bones. They believed that the creature was an adult female that weighed 55 pounds and stood 3.5 feet tall, not anywhere close to a human. Setting aside the fact that there are humans that exist today with those heights and weights, both children and fully grown adults, it doesn't matter that Lucy was short. Nobody claims that she was a human. Height is one of those things that can change over time as a species evolves. But more than that, another fairly complete skeleton that was found of an aforensis was from an individual that was around five and a half feet tall, which is definitely in the normal for human range. And while you do currently have a comparison picture with Lucy beside a bonobo, with the bonobo being 3 foot 8, most sources I'm finding list bonobos as being about 35 inches tall, which is just under 3 feet. It's not unheard of for them to get to 4 feet, but that's not the norm, and 5 feet, like this other specimen, it's just out of the question. But after gluing these hundreds of bone pieces into 47 parts and creating models of what they think the creature looked like, evolutionists came up with some surprisingly human-like creatures. Yeah, the models you have chosen to show are much less hairy than most of the depictions of Lucy that I've seen. I suspect that was on purpose on your part, but the fact of the matter is that we don't actually know how hairy these guys were. It was probably less hairy than a chimp, but more hairy than modern humans, but that is mostly based on speculation. Wow. How do you go from this, to this, to these? With... Years of careful excavation, research corroborating finds, more research, and the occasional scientifically guided artistic rendering that does take a handful of artistic liberties. I feel like we're going in circles already, this is not a good sign. And they didn't even find any hands or feet with Lucy. No significant foot bones were found with Lucy, no. However, other specimens have been found that do contain foot bones, which show rather conclusively that A. afarensis had human-like feet, complete with an arch. These feet would be more useful for upright walking than for quadrupedal walking, and it shows less flexibility than the other apes. They will often use their feet for grasping things, like, say, branches. And then of course we also have the Laetoli footprints, a set of about 70 prints from the A. afarensis species that show clear signs of bipedal locomotion and give us a really good idea of what their feet would have looked like even before we found any foot bones. And what's especially great here is that the display that you're showing that you chose to criticize how human they made them look is literally placed on top of a recreation of the Laetoli tracks, showing how they would have walked to make those tracks. And even if you want to claim that it wasn't A. afarensis making those tracks, I mean, since they're human-like feet, they must have been human, right? The size and spacing of the footprints are indicative of an animal that was about Lucy's size, which either throws a huge wrench into your implicit claim that Lucy was too small to be a human, or the more explicit claim that I'm sure you'll get to later that Lucy was just a bonobo, because these prints were not bonobo prints, and they definitely belonged to upright walkers. And they certainly didn't find any eye whites, a feature that only humans have, and not apes. The sclera, or whites, of the eyes are definitely more prominent in humans than in the other apes. But some of the other apes do actually have white sclera, as can be seen in this clip from later in your own video, which shows a gorilla with visibly white sclera. Now, why do humans have more prominently white sclera? Well, one of the hypotheses is that cooperation, especially while hunting, is what provided the selection pressure that results in this change. While hunting, the early humans could communicate with visual cues, which could include communicating what direction you are currently looking in, which is much easier when there is a high contrast between the sclera and the iris. The other apes tend to live in slightly less cooperative social structures, so concealing the gaze could be an important factor in competing for resources. And research has shown that species that engage in pack hunting are also more likely to have visibly white sclera than species that do not, so this does kind of track. But also, it's entirely possible that this is not the case, it might just be a matter of genetic drift and sexual selection. My point is, this is not a feature that's unique to humans, not even among primates, we just have the most extreme version of it. I wonder if they did this to make her look more human-like. In school textbooks across the country, Lucy is represented as a clear ape-to-human transition, walking upright, holding babies, and gazing intelligently as she walks. What do you mean by gazing intelligently, exactly? How does one measure the intelligence of a gaze? 
Now, the white sclera thing probably was done to make them look more human. The truth is, we don't know when the white sclera first evolved in the human lineage. It's not that big of a mutation, it's simply a lack of pigmentation, so it could have happened pretty much any time. So we don't know what color their sclera would have been, but they did walk upright, and I can't think of a reason why they would have been the only known ape species to not carry their babies. Now, sure, the method of baby carrying can vary, but carrying babies is something that we all do. This seems like superfluous nitpicking, if you ask me. This teaching sows seeds of doubts in the minds of Christian students, leading them to believe that the biblical creation account is based on far-fetched fantasies. If teaching accurate science sows seeds of doubt in Christian students, don't blame the accurate science. Maybe start with asking why being scientifically accurate would make someone doubt Christianity in the first place. But is this really true? Is Lucy really our early human ancestor? It is entirely possible that Afarensis was not actually our direct ancestor, but that our real ancestor from that time period was another species that we have not discovered at this time. But that other species likely would have shared some of the same adaptations that we have found in A. Afarensis, so Afarensis makes a good stand-in. Well, let's take a look at the evidence from head to toe. Starting with Lucy's skull, we really don't have much to go on. As leading paleontologist Dr. Leakey said, Lucy's skull was so incomplete that most of it was imagination made of plaster of Paris, thus making it impossible to draw any firm conclusion about what species she belonged to. Well, I can't actually find the full context for that quote. The only places it seems to show up are on creationist sites that don't give much more than we've just heard. Except for the fact that it's not quite a Richard Leakey quote, it is a quote from whatever author wrote the article in the Weekend Australian that this was taken from, which unfortunately they don't seem to have their archives online, so I couldn't look it up in its original form. So whatever author wrote this article is the one that is being quoted here, but it's being attributed to Richard Leakey, but the only part of that quote that actually comes from Richard Leakey is the imagination made of plaster of Paris bit. But let's just grant this whole thing for argument's sake. Discard Lucy's skull completely. We can't touch it. Now look at this skull from specimen AL444-2. It's still incomplete, but there's a lot more of it than there was for Lucy. And since skulls are symmetrical, we can infer a good deal of information from what we do have for this one without having to use imagination at all. When Lucy's actual skull bones are put together and the empty parts are filled in with what they imagine her skull looked like, she looks surprisingly similar to a modern bonobo. I can't quite figure out your angle here. Was it all imagination and so we can't be sure what her skull looked like? Or did they do it accurately and her skull looked similar to a bonobo skull? Why do you cast doubt on how accurate the reconstruction of Lucy's skull was if your argument is that it looks like a bonobo skull when reconstructed? Pick a lane. Right now, it just looks like you're throwing as much as you can against the wall and hoping that something sticks. While we only have a few broken skull bones from Lucy, other skulls of Lucy's kind show that their spines entered into their skulls at an angle just about like chimps. Yes, it did show that. Well, sort of. Just about like chimps is an overstatement, as we are about to see. So, a couple things here. First and foremost, I found the paper that this chart is from. That diagram on the side with the top skull labeled chimp slash Lucy and the bottom skull labeled humans is completely absent. Nothing like it appears anywhere in this paper. Second, if you look at the numbers for FM orientation, FM being foramen magnum, which is the hole at the bottom of the skull that the spinal cord comes out of, the A. afarensis number is lower than the chimps and gorillas, but not as low as the humans. It's in between. Third, if we look at the FM position index, this number is measuring how close to the front of the skull the foramen magnum is, with a higher number indicating a position that is closer to the front of the skull and a lower number being closer to the back. Chimps are at 12 and 14 for male and female respectively, with gorillas being at 7 and 13. Humans are at 31. The afarensis specimens are 24, 19, and 23. Two out of three of them are much closer to the human number than the chimp or gorilla number, and the third one is still outside of the chimp and gorilla range. So. If we actually look at these measurements more than superficially, what we see is that A. afarensis has a skull that doesn't quite fit the parameters that would be required to be a human skull, but neither does it fit in with the chimps. It's sort of in between, almost as if it were in transition or something. Also, the FM position index is one of the measurements that tells us that they walked upright. Their spine connecting to their skull so far forward would force them upright in order to balance properly showing that she likely walked on all fours and not on two legs like humans. It literally shows the opposite. 
From the abstract of the paper that this chart comes from, we read, These new specimens confirm that in small-brained bipedal Australopithecus, the foramen magnum and occipital condyles were anteriorly sighted, as in humans, but without the foramen's forward inclination. Next, we have the inner ears. Dr. Spohr, professor of evolutionary anthropology, has extensively studied the inner ears of various apes and humans. After studying Australopithecines, he revealed that the balancing system in their ears were the same as modern apes, enabling them to live in trees. Their feet kind of suck for living in trees, but yes, Australopithecine inner ears do have adaptations that are thought to help with arboreal living. This doesn't say much about them being bipedal, just that the ears hadn't quite specialized to bipedality yet, as modern human ears have. One of the lingering questions about the Australopithecine species is whether or not they had completely abandoned existence in trees, and this finding is evidence that they had not. Though I think you might have gotten your specific species mixed up for this one, I couldn't even find anything about the ear bones of Australopithecus afarensis, it's usually data from Africanus, but it is being assumed to be similar in afarensis. Next, we have this vertebrae that was believed to be part of Lucy for over 40 years. Recently, scientists learned that it was actually from an extinct relative of the baboon. Once again, what is your point in bringing this up? Do you deny that Lucy existed at all? Are you claiming that she's just a bonobo, as you have suggested several times already? How does this discovery serve that purpose? More to the point, the original paper published on Lucy's bones noted that one of the vertebrae looked different from the others and even had a different texture. So they knew that something was up, but in order to protect the original bones, researchers since then have been studying high-resolution casts of the bones, which, while amazing, do not capture differences like texture or sheen, which were clues that led to the eventual discovery that it was from a different animal. But to quote Dr. Mark Meyer, the researcher who discovered this discrepancy, Lucy clearly walked on two legs, as her anatomy testifies. She is a bipedal ape. This one particular vertebra does not change the overall story. Also, I should point out that during the research that found this bone to be out of place, they confirmed that all the other bones are indeed Lucy's. When Johansson first discovered Lucy's pelvis, he reported it was badly crushed with distortion and cracking. His team believed that it had been broken apart and then fused together during later fossilization. A reasonable conclusion, as that is something that happens frequently with fossilization. And considering the hip didn't fit well with the legs in the form that it was found in, it stands to reason that that is what happened here. Which caused it to be in an anatomically impossible position, and to flare out like a chimp's pelvis. Yeah, see? I know you're going to focus on the flare out like a chimp's pelvis part of the sentence, but keep in mind that you also did say it was in an anatomically impossible position. That was not about making it look less chimp-like, that was about how the other bones would have to have attached to it. Their solution to this? Use a buzzsaw to cut it apart and piece it back together. That is not what they did with the original, as is being heavily implied here. They made a cast out of it, and then did that to the cast. Then, when they cut the damaged pieces of her pelvis out, they fitted them together, and after removing the kink from the pelvis that made it look chimp-like, everything else fit together perfectly. After this pelvis reconstruction, they noted, it was a tricky job, but after taking out the kink of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Okay, fine, fine, next time I'll just wait and I'll let you debunk your own points. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Yep and is consistent with a bipedal Lucy. Even evolutionists in the famous Human Evolution Journal have problems with this reconstruction, stating, We think that the reconstruction overestimates the width of this pelvis area, creating a very human-like sacral plane. Yes, they did say that, immediately before going on to describe how Lucy's pelvis might not have been as human-like as that reconstruction had led us to believe, but that their newer reconstruction does not preclude bipedality and does have some distinct differences from the non-human ape lineage. So again, it's not quite human, it's not quite ape, it's kinda in between. Almost as if it were in transition or something. Now we have Lucy's wrist. When looking at a cast of Lucy's bones, experts at George Washington University revealed that her wrist was stiff like a chimpanzee's. This enabled Lucy's wrist to lock in place for knuckle walking, just like most apes today. Yes, Lucy's wrists likely could lock, which is a trait that is specialized for knuckle walking. Again, this does not call into question the bipedality of the species. If anything, this would either be an evolutionary leftover from a previous knuckle walking ancestor, or it could just indicate that sometimes afarensis would engage in knuckle walking for one reason or another. So I feel like I'm a stuck record at this point, 
but it's almost like it's not quite a knuckle-walking ape, but not quite 100% bipedal. It's kind of in between. Almost as if it were in transition or something. Another study noted, measurements of the shape of wrist bones showed that Lucy's type were knuckle walkers, similar to gorillas. This one was hard to pin down. It's always difficult when they use phrases like, another study noted, instead of just saying which study it is that noted it. In order to find this one, I had to go to the Genesis Apologetics blog post that is essentially just this video, but in text form and with actual references. On that blog, they have that quote saying that it's from the conclusion of a study, and they have it in quotation marks, so hypothetically at least, that means it's an exact quote. They don't name the study in their blog, instead just referring to the authors and the year that it was published, so I figured my best bet would be to search for that exact quote complete with quotation marks. Alas, the only result for such a search was this very page. So I had to resort to searching by the authors and cross-referencing instances when they co-authored a paper together on this subject in that specific year. I did eventually find the paper, and I think I know why they didn't include its name in their video or in their blog. The paper is titled, Evidence That Humans Evolved From a Knuckle-Walking Ancestor. Now, to quote directly from the paper, instead of making up quotes that don't exist, fossil evidence demonstrates that by 4.1 million years ago, and perhaps earlier, hominids exhibited adaptations to bipedal walking. At present, however, the fossil record offers little information about the origin of bipedalism, and despite nearly a century of research on existing fossils and comparative anatomy, there is still no consensus concerning the mode of locomotion that preceded bipedalism. So this paper was not saying that Lucy was a knuckle walker not bipedal, it was saying she exhibited traits from both, and they're proposing knuckle walking as the predecessor to bipedalism in our evolutionary ancestry. So. It's not a question of whether or not Lucy was bipedal, she was. It's a question of whether she was exclusively bipedal, or whether she used other methods of locomotion as well. And these researchers are studying her in order to determine whether knuckle walking was a form of locomotion that filled in the gap between being completely arboreal and being completely terrestrial and bipedal. In fact, the study goes out of its way to point out that knuckle-walking characteristics evolved early enough that it would have placed humans, gorillas, and chimps in the same clade. Previously it had been suggested that knuckle-walking evolved independently in chimps and gorillas, but this study suggests that knuckle-walking as a trait is actually homologous, originating in an ancestor that included the human common ancestor with both chimps and gorillas. Anyway, I can see why you didn't want to name the study. There's just so much evidence for evolution dripping off of it that you couldn't even manage an out-of-context quote for your purposes. You had to make one up instead. Even the fingers of Lucy's kind have been shown to be curved and ape-like, best suited for swinging in trees. Next, we have Lucy's short little legs. Bill Jungers at the Stony Brook Institute in New York argued that Lucy's legs were too short in relation to her arms for her species to have achieved a fully modern adaptation to bipedalism. Oh, for fuck's sake, can one quote in this video just be a normal direct quote from the person that you are claiming to be quoting? Like, quote mining is the thing that happens. Creationists take quotes out of context all the time, but usually the parts that they keep are at least accurate. This quote is not from Bill Jungers. It is a quote from Don Johansson and James Shreve's book, Lucy's Child, in which they are briefly summarizing some of the arguments against Lucy being fully bipedal. Keyword there, fully. To quote the book, it starts off with, Bill Jungers had argued that Lucy's legs were too short in relation to her arms for her species to have achieved a fully modern adaptation to bipedalism. This is a summary of a conclusion of Bill Junger's 1982 paper, Lucy's Limbs, Skeletal Allometry and Locomotion in Australopithecus Afarensis. Now, let's look at that paper, shall we? From the abstract. Using allometric relationships for limb lengths in non-human catarine primates as empirical baselines for comparison, I show here that the limb proportions of A. afarensis are clearly unique among hominoids. Notice that A. afarensis is not clearly the same as a chimp or bonobo, it is clearly unique among hominoids. It's in a category all of its own. Continuing, the data indicate that A. afarensis had already attained forelimb proportions similar to those of modern humans, but possessed hind limbs that were relatively much shorter, hence the intermediate humerofemoral index of AL288-1 compared with Homo sapiens and great apes. And then later on it says the bodily proportions of Lucy are not incompatible with some form of bipedal locomotion, but kinematic identity and functional equivalence with bipedal gait of modern humans seems highly improbable. So to summarize, Afarensis 
does not quite fit in with the humans, but they also don't fit in with the modern non-human apes. It's kind of like they were in between. Say it with me now, almost as if they were in transition or something. While a knee joint was not even found with Lucy, a different knee that was found one year earlier had been used to try to prove that Lucy walked upright. Yep, they found a clearly non-human knee joint that also clearly had adaptations for bipedalism. Before even starting to look for Lucy, this was already being promoted as the first discovery of bipedalism in early hominids. Creationists like to pretend that Johansson found the knee bone the year before at a site that was a couple kilometers away and then proceeded to pretend that it was part of the Lucy specimen in order to bolster the claim that she walks upright, but to the best of my knowledge, this knee has never been claimed to be a part of the Lucy specimen, except maybe accidentally when people mistakenly refer to the species as Lucy instead of the specific Lucy specimen. Anyway, a knee was found a year before, catalogued as AL-129-1, Lucy was found the following year, catalogued as AL-288-1, never has this knee been catalogued as being part of Lucy, and we do, in fact, have some knee bone from the Lucy specimen, so we can confirm that the AL-129-1 was the same species as Lucy, and then we also have other knees, like those found with the first family Australopithecine AL-333. This is becoming another theme with this video. I don't even know what the goal of bringing the knee up was in the first place. Like, yeah, they found a knee from the same species in a nearby location a year earlier, and that knee shows adaptations for bipedalism, just like all the other knees from that species that we have found. This other knee was found over 8,000 feet away from where Lucy was found, and over 200 feet deeper in the ground. Johansson's lead team member said this knee was human, not ape. No, he didn't. What he said was that it was like a human knee that had been shrunk down to the size of a monkey. Everyone who examined it agreed that it was clearly not human. They didn't know what it was, as they had not yet found Lucy. But as I already pointed out, we have enough other specimens from A. afarensis to confirm that this first 1973 knee was also an afarensis, not a human. And even if I grant your absurd argument and say that it was a human, we have other specimens from other finds that are definitely not that also confirm the knee adaptations for bipedalism. Most recently, a team of scientists from the University of Texas conducted 38,000 scans of Lucy's bones. After researching the different breaks and fractures, they concluded that she died while falling over 40 feet out of a tree while she was awake, even trying to break her fall. Lucy, a little 3.5 foot, 55 pound ape that supposedly walked on 2 feet like a human, died by falling 40 feet out of a tree. I'm not even bothering to look into this one because it really doesn't matter. I mean, humans climb trees even to this day while having lost all of the adaptations that would make that easy for us. But I will just point out that apparently these guys trust the scientists to accurately reconstruct the bones to a point where we can determine the cause of death and even that she attempted to break her fall on the way down just from how the bones were broken, but they don't trust these same scientists when they reconstruct the pelvis using these same methods? Made of hundreds of bone fragments glued together to make 47 parts, even accidentally including a vertebrae from a different species, do we really know what she was? Yes, we do. You literally just pointed out that they can get enough accuracy with these reconstructions to discover previously included bones that have been a mistake and to figure out the cause of death. So you either have to dismiss the discoveries that you think support your case, which are made with these reconstructions, or you have to accept that these reconstructions are accurate. Her skull, inner ears, locking wrist, curved fingers, and short legs reveal that she was definitely an ape. We can't trust these findings from all these bone fragments. So here are a bunch of findings from these bone fragments that I trust because I think they support my pre-drawn conclusions. Could the motivated reasoning here be any more obvious? But that's not what evolutionists want you to think. I mean, only one of us had to lie about what these various scientists and their papers have been saying, including obscuring the references in what appears to be an attempt to make it look like you have references while simultaneously making them hard to find, thereby giving you the appearance of legitimacy without the substance. In my case, the references are all linked down in the description. Just go and click the links for yourself and make sure I'm telling you the truth. Shown with human expressions, eye whites, which no apes have, except for the one that you showed in your own video, Whoops. Whoops. Whoopsie. And walking upright, they want you to think she was on her way to becoming human. So far, every time you have used a peer-reviewed paper for anything, the conclusion from that paper has been something along the lines of trait X wasn't quite to the point where it could be considered human, but it definitely didn't fit into the non-human ape category either. It places Lucy in between. 
So, yeah, maybe a couple of artistic renderings have them looking more human than they probably should, but the actual scientific data shows them to be in between humans and the non-human apes. Wait for it. It's almost as if they were in transition or something. They want you to believe that there are hundreds of Lucy's kind buried in the Earth, as in this video where Johansson explains there are 400 Australopithecine specimens and marches an army of hundreds of complete skeletons across the screen. But what he doesn't say is that he's talking about 400 bone specimens. Maybe 400 was referring to the individual bone specimens rather than individuals? I don't know, but we do have specimens from more than 300 individuals. That is, individual animals, not 300 bones. But something tells me that there are more than 400 individual bones, and you're either misquoting him again or he was speaking off the cuff and got the number wrong. If human evolution really happened over millions of years, wouldn't we expect to find more? With over 7 billion humans alive today, shouldn't the ground be filled with transitions of apes still evolving into humans? Yes, and it is. That's how come we found so many. And we've just been looking at Australopithecus afarensis here, but there are all sorts of different species. I have purposely avoided talking about all the other Australopithecine, like Africanus, Anamensis, Robustus, Gari, Ethiopicus, and Sediba, nor have I brought up any of the other Homo species, like Naledi, Erectus, Ergaster, Habilis, Rudolfensis, Heidelbergensis, etc., etc., etc. I could keep going. Fossilization is rare. The numbers we have found are actually quite astonishing. To put it in perspective, only an estimated one bone out of a billion get fossilized. So if the entire human race were to just drop dead today, only about eight skeletons would end up being fossilized. And that's being generous, because some bones fossilize easier than others. There would be an abundance of denser bones, but a scarcity of the more delicate bones. So there likely would not even be one complete skeleton that makes it. It would be just a bunch of partials. So yeah, given how rare fossilization is, it's actually amazing that we have as many hominid fossils as we do. Even Darwin realized that this was a problem by stating, as by my theory, innumerable transitional forms must have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the Earth? Okay, Genesis apologetics, guys, bring it in. I know this might be a shock to you, but we've actually found a few more fossils since Darwin died. Hell, we've even used the theory of evolution to successfully predict exactly where we should find fossils of a specific type. That's how we found Tiktaalik. But you won't find creationists talking about how they knew to look for Tiktaalik where they did. They'll just point out that there are quadrupedal footprints that are older than Tiktaalik, as though that somehow precludes Tiktaalik from being evidence for evolution. So, just what was Lucy? The answer is straightforward. Lucy and other Australopithecines are extinct apes. Yes. Yes, they are just like humans, are extant apes. I'm skipping ahead a bit. He plays clips from a talk that Dr. Johansson gave at the Freedom From Religion Foundation and uses it as evidence that he hates God or something, so he wants Lucy to be our common ancestor so he can continue denying God's existence, as though there aren't a bazillion examples of scientists who fully accept the theory of evolution and are also devout Christians. You say Don Johansson, I say Francis Collins. If Francis Collins being a Christian doesn't prove evolution, then Don Johansson being an atheist doesn't disprove evolution. The truth is, God created land animals on the sixth day of creation. Okay, we're actually done here. I just wanted to use the clip of the gorilla with the white sclera again. They've gone into summary mode at this point. They don't introduce anything new. Well, not about Lucy. They go into a bunch of stuff about human brain size and our ability to speak language, as though that proves that we are made in the image of God or something. But that feels like a giant pivot at this point. I'll just assume that they continue with their pattern of getting absolutely everything wrong. Today's comment of the day comes just from Aaron S. through my email, who says, A pox on your house. After hearing of Hollow Knight on a Vice Rhino live stream, I downloaded and started playing it. As a result, I say, Curse you and anyone that looks like you. How dare you make me play the soul ensnaring game? You should be ashamed of yourself. May your horn fall off. Aaron, I'm really glad you're enjoying the game. It really is a fantastic game. It's so good. Love it. I can't wait for Silk Song to come out. Silk Song being the upcoming sequel or prequel. We don't really know. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Clint Cheesewood, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the trait that doesn't quite fit in with the human that is my channel or the ape that is the apologetics channel. If you'd like to be almost as if you were in transition or something, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. Remember to head to the link in the description for 83% off a Surfshark subscription. 
if for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!